All right. Hello. Looks like we've just gotten everyone coming in. I'm getting my computer space all set up. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, looks like we still have a few more people streaming in, so I might just give us a minute um, to let anyone, you know, logging on, finish logging on. Uh, but in the meantime, sometimes it's interesting just to see where folks are calling in from. So if you just want to drop a, a message in the chat, where are you calling from today? That might be interesting to know. Nice. Cool, cool. You might have spent some time in Chicago, Etta, right? <laughs> Fort Collins, nice, close by. Oh, cool. Nice, nice, nice. It's always really fun to see where people are calling in from. Okay, well, it looks like this might be our group. And so I imagine other people might join as we're chatting. Um, we are recording this conversation just so folks who can't make it um, are able to watch it online afterwards. Um, so if you're uncomfortable with that, you're welcome to leave the call now and you can maybe email us a message if you want, um, but then this will be online. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, and welcome. This is the Experimental Weaving Residency Information Session. Uh, my name, aha, let's go to the next slide. My name is Laura Devendorf. I'm the director of the Unstable Design Lab here at the Atlas Institute, the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and my co-organizers, uh, we're still waiting for Stephen to join the call. So maybe they'll jump in in a little bit. Uh, but my co-organizers for this residency are Stephen Frost, who is a professor of media studies at CU Boulder and also associate director of the lab here. Um, and then I'll let Etta introduce herself. Hi, I'm uh, Etta Sandry. Um, I was a previous experimental weaver in residence, and um, I'm now a PhD student in the lab and uh, am a part of the residency board and have been supporting Laura and, and Stephen organizing the residency uh, for the next round. Cool. Um, so just to confirm, can all of you see our slides? Maybe thumbs up or something in the chat. Perfect. OK, thank you so much. Um, all right, so we also will be assisted in this process uh, by our lovely selection committee, which you'll, you'll notice this year is actually quite a bit smaller than we've had in the past. We're going to keep it smaller and a bit more focused. Our committee this year is Bukola Kowiki, who is a conceptual fiber artist and educator, Marianne Fairbanks, who's an associate professor of design studies at UW-Madison, and Sarah Rosalena, who is a professor of computational craft and haptic media at UC Santa Barbara. So everyone on the committee is also a practicing artist with a foot or two feet or, you know, some amount of their body into fiber arts as it would be. And we've selected the committee this, um, this time around to really focus in on a lot of different aspects of a fiber arts practice. So from community engagement to thinking more about legacies and histories of craft um, to thinking about different design and fashion perspectives as well. So yeah, I think our interests in this residency are really represented well by um, our selection committee. So um, you already gave us a sense of who you are, basically where you're from, but maybe just say a quick hello in the chat. Uh, we'd love to know who you are and maybe, yeah, a little bit more. Maybe what's your favorite snack food? That's always a fun topic. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll let people take a moment to type in. Popcorn. <laughs> Yay, Edda. <laughs> nice. All right, we'll come back to that later. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Travis. Um, ooh, wasabi peas and chocolate covered peanuts might be really interesting to try together. 
Um, I just went backpacking with a bunch of Oreos and a Channel Island fox stole them from me. Um, so that's, that's a fun fact. Um, okay, so our plan for the meeting today is really just to give you a brief overview of the residency structure and the review process. And then we're hoping to devote at least a half hour um, at the end to a Q&A. So any questions you might have that you wanna ask. If questions come up just while we're waiting, you're welcome to just type them right in the chat. That tends to be um, the quickest way to get our attention. So the main things uh, are the dates. So today is the information session. We're also gonna post this on YouTube and the main call for entries page for the res residency, for the residency afterwards. The application deadline is February 18th. Uh, we're based in mountain time here in Colorado, so we just make all of our deadlines midnight mountain time. If you submit at 3 a.m. mountain time, I think it's gonna be okay, but that's our, our deadline. Um, we will go through a process after we get the first round of applications and that we start kind of whittling down to a short list and then a group of finalists. Our first kind of trimming to the short list will take place in early March. Then we'll compile the short list, review those, make our selection of finalists mid-March, and then we'll make a final artist notification and we'll let the person who's been picked know in late March. We'll get all those materials together and we'll announce publicly um, in April 2024. And so I know some residencies, you may apply and you don't hear back until the announcement. We will send you an email to let you know um, if the application isn't going to go forward or if it is. So you'll hear from us either way. We are intending for this residency to take place. Um, it's a 12 week residency and we can be slightly flexible with the dates and timing. Uh, we want it to happen during the academic spring semester, which for us is January 15th to May 15th. So any 12 week period between then, uh, we should be able to make work. And we can also, you know, if you have something you're working around, let us know and we can also work towards accommodating that as well. Um, it's not written on here, but the residency uh, does require you to come to Boulder. So that kind of flexible date and the long timeline is really meant so you can kind of plan a little bit how you're going to get here and where you're going to stay and all that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that's been interesting and has developed through the past is we've been running this experimental weaving talk series. It's an online talk series. It's actually had quite a good international viewership. Um, and a lot of the talk series invitees come from the experimental weaving residency process. So usually, I know it's really, really hard to get so many amazing applications and then choose one. So we've worked with our board in the past to come up with ideas to bring more visibility to the people working in this domain. And that's where the talk series really came from. So if you wanna get an idea of the things we've looked at in the past, the talk series is also a really good way to learn more about the different practices and approaches to experimentation. Um, for the money side of things, uh, we've run this residency for this specific iteration of the residency. This will be our third year, and it's been the same budget each time. It comes with a 9,520 US dollar stipend. Um, the stipend is meant to cover both um, like your pay and also what rent would be while you're visiting. Uh, we will reimburse up to $450 in airfare and the materials budget comes out to about 500. Um, because of the way it's being funded, and I'll talk more about that in a second, the materials budget doesn't go directly to you in the form of a check, but it comes to the lab and then we just make sure we spend it during your residency. Um, we accept applications from domestic and international applicants. The US government will tax the hell out of the stipend if you're an international applicant. And so we have more information about that on the main residency page, but it's worth um, taking a look at that first. That's something that actually snuck up on us a bit uh, during the first residency where we had a resident from Finland. So um, yeah, just be mindful of the taxes that might happen on that <clears throat> residency stipend. 
Okay, so just to say a little bit more about how this residency came about and where the money is coming from. Uh, we've been really fortunate to have support of the National Science Foundation. And so my background is really a little bit more in design and engineering. And when I got this job at CU Boulder, I was expected to run a research lab where you write a lot of design and engineering grants. And I saw a lot of people doing work in smart materials in engineering, but none of them were really consulting with craft people and were coming at it through a lens that just didn't seem to understand what it meant to kind of communicate with the materials and to design out of those materials. So we proposed this residency as a space to kind of bridge um, these different kind of cultural worlds of academic engineering and craftspeople who in many ways are engineers themselves, but are often removed from these processes by, I don't know, institutional barriers for the most part. So that's where the residency came from. We've uh, written quite a bit about the residency as a research model in the field of human computer interaction. And it's actually becoming kind of a nice thing where we're not the only research lab running these residencies now. And so it's becoming a more accepted model of including artists and craftspeople in research. Um, we've had three prior residents um, under this specific funding model. The most recent was Elizabeth Michael John, who joined us last spring. And we let the resident come here and we kind of collectively come up with an idea together. So in the best instances of the residency, it's not like you come with an idea or we give you an idea. We work together to come up with something that we'll want to work on. And then we sort of collaboratively let that develop through the residency. So Elizabeth was really interested in more of the electrical integration. Sorry, let me just take a quick water. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So we really did something that was much more like circuitry based. Um, Etta, do you want to say a little bit about your residency? Yeah, um, so when I came as a resident, I was really excited about um, just doing a lot of sample making and experimentation. I was particularly interested in um, we weave structures that create dimensionality or um, like state change in the cloth, but don't have a lot of experience with electronics and maybe I'm not very interested in electronics. So I wasn't really working um, with that so much, but instead was focused on just learning a lot about different structures um, and creating a lot of different samples um, during my time here, as well as working with Laura on a program that she'll talk about um, in a moment called AdaCAD and kind of like figuring out uh, or like learning more about that uh, software and um, collaborating with Laura on it, like uh, integrating new operations um, to support sample making uh, on the Jacquard. Thanks, Edda. And then our last resident, um, not our last resident, but I'm really losing my voice for some reason. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over and invite Stephen to say hi. <laughs> And Stephen, maybe you can finish this slide for me. Okay, I can definitely talk a little bit about <laughs> Thank um, you. Laura, thanks Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, thanks so much. I'm so sorry, everybody, I'm joining so late. Um, I apologize, but I'm excited to be here. And uh, to talk a little bit about what Elizabeth was doing, um, Elizabeth came in with a lot of collaborators, uh, as previous collaborators. She completed her MFA at... Um, RISD before joining us. And so her work was really focusing um, in a space that was sort of between art and science. And so she was really interested in creating these basically traditional smart e-textiles uh, that we would be able to control um, with diodes. And so this piece that you see here over here, and I don't know if Laura has already explained this, please stop me if I'm wrong. It's pretty amazing. It actually has a little, um, little um, batteries. Um, I'm sorry, little my batteries. Uh, little magnets. Electromagnets. <laughs> oh, electromagnets. <laughs> it's just full of batteries. It's fat. It's a suitcase. There is a battery. <laughs> There's this little electromagnets. And so what you're seeing here is actually controlled also by an app. So with an app, you're able to activate the electromagnets and you can actually 
open and close this. And so this has both commercial and creative applications. Um, of course, she worked very closely with people inside and outside of our lab to create this piece. Um, and it was really a fun collaboration. She was sort of inspired by just sort of the way in which neon threads can really create their own light um, because of their, the way in which they reflect um, other materials. And so she wanted to like really explore that in a much more in-depth way. And so where is this piece going to? Really, this is a sample, right? That will grow into larger pieces, possibly commercial applications, possibly artistic collaborations. I um, mean, it can go in either direction. So for us inside of this residency, what's really important for people to understand is that we're not expecting everybody to come in uh, like Sandra did and be like, okay, this is going to be in a spaceship. No, not at all. Um, really, you have a lot of open space to work, collaborate, find new collaborators, and decide what's going to be best for you. We're not expecting everybody to complete this residency. It's many months, but you don't have to complete it with the idea that I have. you have a solo show ready to go, or you have a prototype ready to go. Nope, not at all. Really, this is a real space of exploration. And and you come here and have some pretty amazing people and collaborators around you that are also willing to jump in. Um, so we're pretty lucky for that. Laura, any other comments about Elizabeth's project? No, I think that's great. I think the only one we haven't talked about yet is Sandra's, um, which was really in closer collaboration with aerospace engineers here at CU Boulder and really thinking about how to monitor electrical activity from the brain. Um, so this would be worn on your forehead and your muscles in your forehead apparently react um, quite noticeably to different physiological states. And so this prototype actually ended up getting developed um, quite a bit more intensively by the aerospace engineers for testing for integration into um, space flight and spacesuits. So that was a pretty exciting and successful residency. Um, but let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So one of the things I just wanted to point to, and just because this residency, as Stephen mentioned, you're kind of, the resident comes in and it's not like we're all doing a project together or we're all working on one thing, but there's lots of things happening side by side. One of those things is a project that I've been leading called ADACAD, which is open source software for woven draft making. And it's borrowing from this paradigm of parametric design, which I'm particularly fond of. So residents aren't expected to use the software, but for someone like Etta, we could sort of custom design her features that she was needing for draft making in the moment. So we don't have technicians on the TC2 itself, or we're kind of expecting people to come in here being ready to go. But we do have a lot of experience in electronics and coding, if that's something that would be a fun kind of parallel collaboration to do. Yeah, so the theme for this residency, um, each each iteration of the residency has had a slightly different theme. Um, and this one is expanding experimentation. Um, and this theme speaks to our desire to expand how we think about experimentation in weaving. Um, as Laura mentioned before, thinking more about politics, uh, textility, and materiality of weaving. Um, as you saw in the previous um, slides, some of our past residents have been very uh, technically focused, maybe working more closely with design and industry, um, making these um, uh, prototypes um, that then can, as Stephen mentioned, go on uh, to be used in different contexts. Uh, with this residency, I think um, we're looking to expand beyond the focus on complex structure as the um, like container of what experimental means within weaving, because we uh, know and acknowledge that experimentation and experimental weaving um, encompasses so much more beyond just structure or um, thinking about engineering uh, and weaving. Um, so uh, with this residency, we're hoping to bring in um, more um, focus on craft and technical knowledge within material practice, um, thinking about different histories and stories um, within uh, th uh, those fields. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe bringing in 
uh, a broader range of practices to include uh, concept-driven work, sculpture, um, garment creation, uh, really expanding the things that we might uh, think of when we think of experimental weaving. Okay, and so I will talk a little bit more about the actual expectations for the artist in residence. Um, I found a cough drop, so hopefully that'll solve some of my voice issues. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. It like has this amazing way to sneak up on me during public speaking. Who knew? Anyway, um, so we're really expecting the chosen resident to work physically in the lab about 30 hours a week. Again, that's not something where we're logging hours, but we really want to share the physical space. And I think most interesting projects and ideas happen because of parallel play or just people sharing a space together. So that requirement is really to just be here and be around. Um, with the resources provided, we really do want this to be a generative experience for everyone involved, um, both for the PhD students and undergraduates who belong to our lab and also for the artist in residence. Uh, the outcomes for this residency, like Stephen said, don't have to be like a finished thing. Actually, sometimes the most like provisional objects are the most interesting. The main requirement is that it has to be shared publicly as something open source. So something you're not feeling ownership over that you would have to keep for yourself, but something that's a technique or an idea or maybe even a provocation or a workshop that you're really open to sharing publicly. Often we do create a catalog to commemorate whatever the research and techniques were. Um, we have a catalog online for Sandra's residency. We're working on Etta's catalog and Elizabeth's. Um, I just made the order from the printer, so we'll have those soon and we'll put a link to the digital PDF on our website. Um, so now, very exciting. Um, Etta was actually gonna use her phone to give us a quick lab tour, just to show you what the space actually looks like, maybe some of the things we have here. Um, and I'm starting to see questions in the chat. Thanks so much. And we will get to those in the Q and A. But if other people are having questions, feel free to just drop them in there. That's the perfect place for them. Okay, Etta, are you ready? Um, bear with me just a moment as I like get the camera going. <laughs> that sounds great. I mean, I think the main the main feature of the residency historically has been that we have a, a three wide TC2 loom. It's a digital jacquard loom and it's threaded at about 60 ends per inch. In addition to the TC2, we'll also have a 24 shaft AVL workshop dobby. Um, that's not here yet, but it's coming. We have multiple eight shaft floor looms. We have a spinning wheel. We have lots of knitting needles. We have a punch card flatbed um, knitting machine as well. Um, and then maybe what's most interesting to me or unique about the space is that we just sort of collect strange materials. So any kind of metallic yarn or a yarn of kind of active materials or something that behaves in a unique way, we tend to kind of stockpile those. So let me check in with Edda again. Yeah, I Thank think you. I'm ready. Um, Perfect. To do the tour. Can everyone hear me <laughs> and see my screen? Okay. Yes. All right. So here I am in the PhD office. Um, so right now we have uh, three PhD students, including myself, and we share this uh, workspace. And then now I'm walking into the main lab space. So um, I'd say it's like a medium sized space, not huge, but not too small. Um, so some of the things we have in the center is this shared work table. Um, it, it can like, it serves a lot of purposes. So it can be like a fabric cutting table, but doesn't totally work as a yardage table. Um, it's also where we meet to have lab meetings. Um, sometimes people eat their lunch there. So kind of like a multi-use space here. Um, we have a few sewing machines in the lab. 
um, a big whiteboard and screen also for meetings. Around the lab, we have a lot of um, project examples. Here is our uh, one of our material storage areas. So lots of different things like um, materials for spinning, uh, drop spindles, knitting and crochet supplies, um, conductive uh, threads and things like that. Um, we just got a new spinning wheel, which Laura may have mentioned, so that's very exciting. Um, in the lab, we have two uh, eight harness floor looms, although sometimes they're in use by Laura's class, though that probably won't happen in the spring semester, but we never know. Um, and then like the, the uh, feature you've all been waiting for probably is our TC2 loom here, uh, our warp needs a little TLC, so it's in a bit of an odd state right now. Uh, right now it's fully um, warped with, I think, a 62 weight uh, cotton. Um, and yeah, so, but uh, within a year that may, it may be a different warp on the loom, who knows? Uh, and then this is the computer that interfaces with the jacquard. Um, let's see, back here. We have our yarn wall. Um, these are all kind of like up for grabs yarns. And then these are all uh, like special project yarns or personal yarns, but um, may be available for resident use. Uh, the back of the loom, our little kitchen space. We do have um, some materials and tools for doing natural dye uh, stored under there. Although you can see it's a pretty like ad hoc kind of like serves as um, like tea station and natural dye, if that's what you're looking for. Um, Laura's office in there, uh, bookshelf and um, our electronics station. Is there anything else I should show, Laura? No, I think I think that just about covered it. Yeah. Could I talk um, or do you mind if I jump in for just a little bit to talk Not about our facilities? Um, so while you guys, while you all are here, we also, this is part of the Atlas Institute is, uh, um, at a, I am still looking at your phone. Um, here we, oh, there we go. Sorry. Hi. Um, so while you're here, the Atlas Institute, just so everybody understands the institution, is that also we have other experimental art design organizations that are part of this building as well. There's a black box experimental theater with motion capture, as well as um, a four camera uh, space there where you could record YouTube videos, where you could make work with dancers. Uh, there's also a space, the BTU lab, which is below us, which stands for blow things up. It's a giant maker space with a wood shop. 3D printers, laser cutters, and the staff there are super open. It's actually open to the community as well as students. So you'd be more than welcome to use that space. So being part of the Unstable Design Lab also means being part of the general Atlas community. There's a coffee shop downstairs, which has really killer boba. I will say it's one of the best coffee shops in Boulder, lucky for us. Um, so it's kind of also not just the Unstable Design Lab, but also the larger Boulder community, including our library, including other resources, like there's an art museum right around the corner um, from our space as well. So it's quite, there's quite a lot to do as well as the mountains and all sorts of nature stuff. So, I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you can do nature stuff if you want. We won't judge you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that concludes the tour and the kind of informational portion. I wanted to open it up to the audience just to ask specific questions that we might be able to help you um, understand if this is the right fit or any questions you have about the residency or the process. Uh, we already have one question in the chat from Aaron about the level of weaving experience. Do we expect the artist to have prior to the residency? I think it all depends on what your uh, practice is like, right? I think we're interested in whatever resident that we pick, we're bringing in the resident as the resident, right? So if you are a spinner, for instance, we might not expect you to like know how to use the jacquard loom and maybe your practice um, integrates with weaving in a different way, right? Like we have quite a few weavers in the space. We, um, tend to have other projects in mind. So there's other ways to kind of be involved with those projects. 
Um, I think it needs to be in conversation with weaving to some respect, but you don't necessarily have to be, you know, the most experienced weaver in the world. Historically, all of our residents have been pretty badass weavers, um, but that's not necessarily a requirement. Um, one, one thing to add is that mm -hmm. we don't have the capacity to train anyone. So um, if you are coming in and wanting to use the TC2 loom, for example, or any of the um, equipment, um, there's definitely a lot of like collaboration and sharing that happens in the lab, but we can't like really teach you how to use any of the equipment. Yeah, thanks for adding that. Yeah, I think it depends on, you know, also just being really honest with your application of where you're at and where you'd like to be. Um, so this is not, it's more of a yes and situation where like, depending on where you're at, like let us know where you're at and we're happy to chat with you about what that is. If you have a really amazing idea, that might totally change our attitude on what our expectations are as well. So we're pretty open to a lot of stuff. Um, the next question that's in here is a really easy one. How cold will it be in January and February? Unfortunately, this is Colorado. So you will have some beautiful, sunny, 60 degree days where you can go outside and go for a hike in the mountains and it's totally dry and nice. And then you'll have subarctic, terrible cold days. Uh, January and February goes either way. I like, I work out like twice a week outside and it's totally fine and great. And I really enjoy it. But also like today I was not working out outside cause it's like 20. So it, it varies. Yeah, and it's a really dry 20. So at least if it's 20 degrees, like I bike to work, my biking threshold is 15. And that's when it's just officially too cold to function. But 15 in Boulder is like 40 in the Bay Area of California. <laughs> you know, like, it's interesting because it is a really dry cold. Uh, but we do get nice snow. Um, yeah, but it is, it's chilly. Today, it's like 20 and windy, which is like the worst it could possibly be. Um, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> we're in that like mid January, late February part, it's not great, but it will get better. As you hear, that's the best part about the spring semesters that by the time you're here, we'll be outside all the time enjoying it. Um, the next question is about the 24 shaft AVL Dobby loom. Yes, it's coming any day now. And I anticipate and we anticipate that it'll be up and going by a year from now. We, we yeah. can pretty much put a guaranteed stamp on that and really excited uh, to have that here. Thanks, uh, Etta, for leading that effort and for really pushing us on that. We're so excited um, for that. And, you know, that's just kind of an example of how we flow here. You know, the people that are in the lab really drive the needs of how we develop it and how we build it forward. One of the reasons why we're doing the call almost a year in advance this time is that so we can really know, like, and anticipate what the needs of the incoming resident will be and be really prepared for them when they get here. If they know they're going to be wanting to work on the ADL, okay, cool. We're going to make sure that the other students are not going to be planning to do that the whole time and that we can give that resident priority. Um, the next question here, what kinds of community involvement opportunities are possible? Um, that's a great question. Um, if you guys know my practice, I'm very involved with the local community, the library, uh, working with LGBTQ organizations here in Boulder. And so for everyone, that's going to be based on what your practice is and what you're interested in. Um, I'm going to fill, if you are super interested in community involvement, I will fill up your plate with opportunities. Uh, but if that's not your vibe, totally okay. Uh, we have collaborations right now with the BT Lab, as well as the Boulder Public Library, as well as other community members. Uh, Laura and I have a long going project with the uh, Boulder, I mean, sorry, with the Denver Public Libraries and integrating weaving into their pedagogy and into some of their public practices. And so that is definitely something that if you're interested in that and you want to get involved with, we want to make that happen for you. Um, but like I said, once again, it's really going to be based on what your interests are um, as an artist um, joining us. Um, Laura, do you want to take the next question, which is um, which is a question uh, from Aaron? Uh, Aaron, I'm, go ahead and unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, this you're muted. Been, Here you go. Sorry. This might have been addressed earlier. I know I did come in um, late, uh, but I was wondering if you could expand on the idea of like experimentation within weaving. Um, like, I have an understanding of how the process works. Um, but I guess I'm trying to visualize what you mean when you say expanding from 
like experiments and structure to conceptual experiments. Do you have like potential examples of like projects you think um, to help us kind of better understand that? Yeah, I think, um, so I think the term experimentation is something that when we started this residency, we were, and the talk series mostly, we were hoping to like collectively define since my background's in this more like computer science engineering space, I kind of immediately went to like the mechanics and the structure, like the structural possibilities of cloth. And I think that tone definitely rippled through the residency in many ways that I think a lot of the focus we've had on experimentation has been around the process of making really complex structures or behaviors in some ways. Um, and I think that's where I'm seeing more possibility um, to kind of be more open to practices that don't feel as engineering, right, but are very impactful nonetheless, right? So I think this is maybe also an artifact of my thinking expanding from experimentation being very like mechanical technical to being much more socially engaged and much more like weaving is this process with tens of thousands of years of history and that in itself i think has a lot of areas for exploration that haven't really been looked at so i mean other projects um there's one project that was big in the eu called the penelope project and that was much more from a social science perspective but it was tracing different case studies as weaving as technical knowledge so instead of trying to bring technology to weaving, really looking at the practices of weavers and understanding them as technology and, and techne. I think another one of the talks that I was really, um, I think really brings a different aspect to what we've been looking at would be um, Lars Shima Bakuro's experimental weaving talk series talk. I think their practice really resonated with a lot of the ideas that I've been thinking about in terms of broadening as well. But I'll open this to others because I'm not the only voice in the process. I mean, I'll just echo everything you said, Laura, and as well as, you know, this is going to be, it's really a prompt also for our committee, which would be, you know, our committee members who are the primary people who help us make this decision. And so really opening up the exploration to be, yes, not more, not as structurally focused, maybe not as focused on uh, material play, but maybe focusing more on cultural and conceptual um, play um, and how that interacts with other fields. I think that's probably the basic and most, the simplest way to place it um, uh, for us. And so, you know, we always love a very strong technical weaver, love that. That's going to definitely make you stand out in some ways but also somebody who is conceptually focused or who thinks about the practice of weaving, as Laura was saying, in a larger and longer cultural practice. If you're really interested in what we're interested in, uh, the talk series is a great place to start. Um, and I'll, send, I'll drop a link to that in the chat in just a minute when I'm done yakking. Um, and that talk series really shows you the kind of breadth of things that we're looking at. Um, and I'll also second and echo uh, Laura's um, Laura's comment about Lars's lecture, which I think for many of us was just super inspiring, and we'd love to see more of that in our lab. Um, yeah, just to add, uh, the prompt is also for all of you. Like, I think um, that's part of what Laura is talking about is like collectively building this understanding of experimental weaving. So one of the application questions, I think, is what does experimentation mean to you? So like connecting your practice whatever it is um, with these idea concepts of experimentation and whatever weaving means in your practice as well. Yeah, and I'm recalling when we were talking about this next residency with the members of the lab, we were also like, you know, what, what would you want or what are you interested? In? And a lot of people were interested in the body, you know, and the body and garment in a stronger way than we've done in the past too. So I think we're kind of open you know, not just to like swatch and structure, but to like work, what context do they go in? How do they engage with the body or the environment? And those kind of questions as well. Yeah. Um, um, another... mm, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm gonna just direct this question towards um, Etta who did our, who transferred from 
resident artist to PhD student, as I'm sure you guys all heard earlier in the lecture. Um, and this is a great question. Um, what kinds of research and pro uh, and questions are, pro are students asking and pushing in connection with the lab? Um, I know, Edda, you're doing some great stuff. I don't know if you want to just briefly touch on some of the other big uh, projects that we're doing in the lab. Yeah, so um, like I said, right now there's two other PhD students working in the lab. Um, one of them is focused on um, this really incredible research creating um, bio-based uh, fibers out of gelatin as an industry byproduct uh, with the goal that the fibers could um, be used in the creation of electronic uh integrated textiles so that at the end of the use of the textile, the fiber could be dissolved and the electronics could be reharvested. So that's been a big focus of her um, research in the lab. Um, and uh, one of the other PhD students is really interested in kind of how we collaborate with machines and also um, very in line with the residency, how um, uh, engineers, researchers, and technical practitioners collaborate with artists, and then like how we can build tools together and kind of uh, build the tools that we want to use to create uh, new kinds of work. Um, and then we also have some really awesome um, undergraduate students who work in the lab. Um, they work with us on uh, like uh, this past semester, uh, we had a working group um, to meet weekly and kind of work on AdaCAD, the software that Laura was talking about earlier. So that was a group composed of me, another PhD student and one of the undergrads. And it was kind of like thinking about like who is the audience for this tool and like what kind of um, applications do we want it to have and things like that. Uh, they also, the undergrads also support um, the lab in um, all of the different kinds of projects that are happening um, and also do a lot of their own amazing work, including like knitting, like there's one undergraduate student who like every day has a, a new, like incredibly knitted garment. <laughs> so yeah, so a lot of cool things happening, a lot of different, um, yeah, different threads. Oh my gosh, Caleb is the king of the like uh, crocheted garment. Everybody's gonna be should be super jealous of that uh, um, of their looks. I'm every time I see like, uh, yeah, you'll meet them if you come. It's amazing, and they're a first year student, so they blow my mind. Um, our next question here, um, we can touch on briefly. Laura, I'm gonna ask you since you administer um, the visa process. What kind of stipend, uh, uh, what kind of cuts does it take for international students uh, when they are international uh, residents when they come in? What's the percentage just to give them an idea of that? So I'm trying to, I was trying to look at the exact number. I don't have an exact number. I think, honestly, I'm remembering it being like 30% to half, like it was significant. Um, I want to say it might also depend on your country of origin, um, but because you're being paid in the U.S., the U.S. decides that it can collect a certain amount of this money. Maybe this has changed with the new funding structure, but it's kind of a hard thing to trace down. <laughs> so it would have to be something that should you advance through the process um we don't look at country of origin early on as we're making our selection um if that is something that's going to be a concern for you you're welcome to note it on the application and as we move forward we could get much more specific um the bureaucracy of cu boulder is fascinating and massive um so it might it will take like a a coordinated effort to get exact numbers <laughs> So we might just hold off on that until a little bit later, if possible. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. I mean, the, the great thing about working in an R1 research school is that you have a, the amazingness of all of the resources of an R1 research school, but also it's its own economy and its own econ like everything. So it's like all of the awesomeness of like amazing libraries and amazing folks around you doing like mind blowing work, but also, yeah, the bureaucracy is real. It's real. Um, 
Um, the next question, uh, Helena, you have a great question, which is, would be open to process work from fiber to cloth? Yes, absolutely. We just had a visiting artist who was hanging out in our space, Catherine Walters. You can actually see her talk. She's a past uh, talk, gave a, one of our uh, lectures in 2022. And she was really thinking about the ways in which natural fibers, we can work with the twist to create particular effects inside of a fiber. Um, and so we were all like really into spinning this fall. And that's why we got our own spinning wheel. Um, and so, yeah, we love that process. And actually Colorado is a really interesting state if you're interested in going from like farm to fiber, farm to fiber to cloth. Uh, we have a huge population of people with alpacas, yaks, paca vacunias, um, as well as uh, churwolves, sheep. So there are a lot of really cool local people that we're happy to connect you with. Um, washing wool in our lab, I'm going to ask you to do that in your home because uh, it's real stinky. But we can find a way if that's something you're interested in uh, doing as well. Um, we're really open to it. And there's a real tradition of that in our location Um from indigenous communities to craft communities that exist here. The idea of going from field to garment is something that is definitely part of the conversation here in Colorado. And we love we love engaging with it and are doing it even more and more um, as we move through it. And just to answer your question really quickly here, Christine, yes, we assist, we assist you with the visas and the bureaucracy 100%. We don't leave you out to hang uh, with that. Unfortunately, that is also part of our job. So we'll be happy to do that. And I, I say, by I say we, Laura lifts the a lot of that. And thank you, Laura, for being uh, on that visa process. Well, by Laura, you mean Randy. <laughs> Who's <laughs> our admin? Um, yes, Randy with an I. Um, uh, um, but we've okay. done it. I'll just say on the the visa processing. I have a link um, on the residency webpage of what the actual classification would be. I think it's like a, a scholar visa. So there are certain rules about it. Um, you'll have to process, you know, with your local, your home country to get your side of it done but then anything that's on the cu boulder application side we can help you with here and we've done it now twice and so we have a pretty good sense of that workflow and the timelines i would say it usually takes three to six months so the long timeline for the application also helps make yeah. sure we can get the visa in time yes that's a big part of it too um Sorry, just jumping through all these questions so that we can get them all in before we leave today. Um, Aaron had a great question. What resources are used and past to help finding housing and accommodations? Another reason we're really planning far out this time is that hope for so hopefully we can get the best popular possible housing accommodations uh, for our resident artists. The first thing we do is we reach out to our general community. So it would be like a room share or a cottage house in the back of a local person's place to stay with. Um, we don't, because this residency doesn't run constantly, we don't have a set place for people to live, uh, but we do have quite a network of resources. Um, when Etta was here, she actually stayed in my neighbor's um, house. And um, the first, Sandra, the first resident we had actually stayed at Laura's and my house in our guest bedrooms. Um, and so we do put a lot of work into finding places for you um, as, before you come here. Um, and as far as grants to offset the costs, Another reason we're running this so far ahead of time is that so, you know, we will make any things that become available, resources that we see to apply for additional funding, we'll make those available to you, but also we'll give you and your local community opportunities to look for um, for funding resources there. That's another reason we move this timeline out, and I'm really super excited about it for that reason that we'll have a lot more time for a landing strip. Um, I'm wondering if Etta, having most recently done this search, might be able to also give some insight. Um, yeah, so I have now moved to Boulder three different times in the last two years. And the first time that I came, I did find housing through Craigslist. Um, it was like a sublet, a temporary sublet in a house with two other roommates. Um, and uh, it definitely was challenging to find something in my budget, but definitely not impossible. You know, just like the process that you go through to find housing anywhere. The last two times that I moved here, um, the housing opportunities, like Stephen said, really came through um, like the, 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 the their networks. <laughs> um, so like Stephen said, staying subletting from their neighbor and then um, 
uh, now subletting from someone who's another Atlas faculty. So there's also people around who are eager to like support visiting artists, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, so um, I think that uh, the uh, budget for the residency tries to account for housing costs. Um, to be transparent, my budget has always been around $1,000 a month. Um, and I was able to find stuff within that or below um, each time that I've tried to find housing here. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, there's a question just about like, yeah, maybe the residency isn't the right fit right now. Are there other ways to engage with the lab? Um, I think the talk series has really been the most accessible way to engage with the lab. We just finished our talk series for the fall um, because we're running the residency cycle now, I'm guessing we won't have another talk series until 2025. But actually, that's something we haven't discussed that maybe we'll discuss and maybe we'll have one in 2024 too. Um, but there's also a, a mailing list just from our uh, the Unstable Design webpage. I think at the very bottom of the page, it just says sign up for the mailing list. And we don't spam it too often maybe we send four emails a year max just to be like hey here's what we're doing or you know one time we ran a workshop with the praxis digital weaving uh conference and so announcing kind of events like that that might be more broadly applicable um yeah um so let me see just to add a note to that too laura is that if you have ideas for collaborations, if there's conferences you think we might be a great fit for, or you're interested in particular research, uh, technical or conceptual coming out of our lab, reach out to us. I think Laura and I are also always happy to um, look at our schedule and find time to meet and chat with people. Um, over the summer, if you're coming through town and you're visiting a relative or family member, or you're at Rocky Mountain National Park, we're only an hour away from there, 40 minutes from Denver. So often we have people just literally say, hey, I'm gonna be there next month. And we're a pretty friendly bunch of people. So please come say hi. Uh, we'd love to show you around the lab. If one of us is available, we're not always, but if we are, we're super happy to do that and to like literally welcome you in uh, if you're in town where we, we love guests. It's, it's, uh, it's something that we really um, enjoy. Um, oh, we got another waiting room. So yeah, I see there's a question here too about the travel stipend be applicable for gas money. My, I will tell you with 85% certainty, yes, but because the funding comes from a grant and because on the grant we said airfare, there's a small chance that we would have to do some sort of fun budget work to make that work, but I think that should totally be possible. Yeah. You, have a, you have a flying car, it would make it just so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, or yeah, I know it's, we should. I think Amtrak for sure. <laughs> It'll only take you, actually, I've heard the Amtrak ride here from the West Coast is really lovely. Um, and then just to go back to another question we had about what do we mean specifically mean by garments and the body? Currently, what students are, are typically working on now are prototypes that may become part of larger uh, pieces. We had some students who um, harvested basically uh, textiles from recycled plastic, then wove that fully into a little mini garment, uh, working with other students. And then, like I said, we have people working with biofibers. So they're building kind of prototypes that maybe become part of larger projects. Those biofibers fibers were used in foam for like sports gear, because that's a thing that people just throw away all the time and just goes into landfill. So that was a really interesting application. Um, but like, I'm a sewer, sewer, I'm a garment maker. I know that Laura likes to make garments as well. So we uh, don't tempt us with tailoring and uh, building garments because that's uh, which is fun. <laughs> we do have dress forms for people to use here. And the BTU lab, which is downstairs, has a industrial sewing machine that'll go through leather. We have, um, tons of just regular brother sewing machines. We have a, a overlock machine. We also have tons of different textile materials as far as uh, garment construction. And I teach a garment construction workshop um, in the summer uh, that our students help us with. 
Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're into tailoring and garment construction as well. And I think that the idea of taking something off the TC2 and turning it into a really particular garment is something that a lot of students in the past have worked with as well. Yeah, there's a question too about lab access. Um, yeah, you get an access card and it unlocks the building and the lab. Uh, certain shared spaces like the BTU, you would have to have probably go through a training to get access to that space outside of normal working hours. Um, but yeah, access isn't usually a problem. And I know some places have like building curfews and things. And in America, we don't have healthy work-life balance. So no one's going to impose any kind of curfew. <laughs> They're like, stay all the time, play ping pong. There's coffee downstairs. Don't go home. Yeah. I go home. Just, I mean, with that said, I try to keep the lab as a space with a really healthy work-life balance. I have a family and two kids. So, you know, I think we're not expecting the person to live in the lab and to work 24 hours because I personally think that's unhealthy and leads to maybe ideas. I don't know. You do you. People work different ways, but I like to encourage going home at five. And that seems to be a very cool thing that everyone does in Boulder. Because then you have to go outside and enjoy the nature and drive your Subaru. <laughs> Neither of us have Subarus. <laughs> I have a minivan, so I'm the worst. But anyway, sorry. I shouldn't say these things about Colorado. Love Subarus. They're great. Um, we're getting to All the end of drive. time. I know. All wheel drive. They're so cool. That's the awesomest. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. <laughs> So I just want to put this up. This is going to, of course, be uh, something that we add to the YouTube channel. If you have any questions, you can, um, instead of writing comments underneath our YouTube video, which we may not see immediately, please do reach out to us um, at our colorado.edu email address. Um, mm. and let us I know. have a different uh, email. I'll chat in because I take all the lab inquiries to unstabledesignlab at gmail.com. Perfect. Our um, Colorado one is a disaster. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> We're very imperfect, but perfect. That's great. Um, any other questions? Uh, we have time for one last uh, here, if anybody wants to drop those or raise their hand. Otherwise, we'll send you all off. I hope it's warm where you all are. Um, any other last questions? Cool. Well, hey, I really appreciate your interest that everybody has had here today and coming. Um, it's really encouraging, and I look forward to seeing all of your applications. And this is not you know, some weird, um, this is not some weird invisible process. If you have a question about your application, if you're wondering if something is appropriate, if you're wondering if you wrote something right, reach out to us through that email address and we're happy to answer that. We're really trying to not be mega gatekeepers. Um, unfortunately with the funding, this is really for one artist. So we wanna make sure all of you have the strongest applications possible, an application that really reflects who you are and what your plans are. So if you have any questions, it's no problem. Just let us know. We're not gonna be like, sorry, can't, can't answer that question. We're really open and happy to answer those questions. Um, Laura, last thoughts, Etta? Um, you, were, you were like, oh, we should remind people that the application is free. And so <laughs> we don't charge for you to apply. That's the only thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming, uh, for your interest, uh, for your support, and for the kind words that are popping up in the chat right now. And yeah, we look forward to learning more about you. All right. Thank you all. Have a great day. Stay warm. Enjoy your enjoy your days. And we'll see you all <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, later this year. Sounds good. All right. Steven, should I go ahead and end the call or do you want to stick around after? You mind if we chat for just a second, Laura? Mm -hmm, not at all. All right. I'm going to kick everybody out. Bye, everyone. <laughs> I wish my voice.